thank you so much. And thanks everyone for joining my talk about yeah, exploring the role of centralization in IPFS. First, a few words about me. So I'm a research engineer at uh, Protocol Labs, and I'm at a, yeah, in, in a team that's called Probe Lab, and we're doing protocol benchmarking and propose, yeah, doing measurements and using these measurements to uh, propose protocol optimizations. Uh, you can find me in all these, with all these handles um, all over the web. And um, me and my team, we work closely with external collaborators on um, the centralization aspects on IPFS. And that's what I want to share today with you. Um, to set the base, uh, I, s I will start with a brief overview of IPFS. I believe many of you already have heard at least of IPFS, but I will explain um, just a few bits that we need for the later parts. Um, then I will go into the challenges of decentralization IPFS. So we identified three, three challenges that I want to talk about. Then I want to propose or like I, I want to present the designs that we developed at Protocol Labs to um, tackle these challenges. These are the hybrid components. And finally, I will yeah, present the measurements that we did to actually assess if these uh, hybrid components solved the ch challenges that we identified previously. And then I will give, give an outlook of what's happening. Um, so first of all, what is IPFS? IPFS is a decentralized storage and delivery network which builds on peer-to-peer -peer networking and content-based addressing. And IPFS is actually much more, much more than you probably think. So if you look at the specification of IPFS, IPFS the IPFS stack is a, a suite of specifications and tools that share two key characteristics, which is content-based addressing and transport agnosticity. So it's not just Kubo that probably most of you are familiar with, but it's also Helia, which is the JavaScript implementation of the IPFS protocol. There's Elastic IPFS, Lotus, and, and many more that you can find uh, on the documentation site there. Um, what is IPFS in, in stats? So I will just talk about the Kubo network that IPFS will bootstrap into. Um, as I said, there are also m more networks like the Falcon network. And from that vantage point, we identified 31,000 nodes um, continuously participating in the public DHT. Or, like All of these are estimates. Around 230,000 unique DHT clients, uh, 2.8 million unique gateway clients per day, and 120 million requests that we see with our, um, DH, um, in our HTTP gateways, which we'll also get into a, a little bit later. And I want to emphasize that all of these numbers are just from our vantage point at Protocol Labs, so these are probably much higher. So there's plenty of usage um, of IPFS here. Um, to understand the co um, components that I will go into in a second, we briefly need to revisit how IPFS actually works. So simplistically, IPFS uses the hash of the content as its content identifier, so you can see an example there. And as opposed to HTTP, a location-based protocol, requests are for the actual content using that hash, and we're not using the address of the host storing it. This creates a problem, most notably, so where is the content for that hash? And there's like the traditional decentralized uh, indexing option, which is the Kademlia DHT. And the Kademlia DHT basically indexes two types of records. One is the provider record, which maps a content ID that we see up there to a peer identifier, which looks roughly the same. This doesn't bring us much. And then it indexes also peer records, which maps these peer IDs to actual network addresses. So we need to do two lookups in the DHT to actually find the hosts that are actually storing the content to retrieve it. And when we want to make content available to the network, we need to store these provider records in the DHT, and for that we do it, uh, we need to contact 20 peers. This is also relevant in, in a few seconds. So to make one piece of content available, we need to at least store this provider record with 20 peers. Conversely, when we want to look up that CID, we need to find at least one of these peers to actually um, figure out the network address where it's hosted. And this is also the first challenge that we identified. So if you're a content provider with a lot of data, massive content publication becomes a big challenge. So as I said, we need to first identify the 20 closest peers in this Kademlia hash space and then store that record with them. And because we need to do it for, with 20 peers and do this lookup all over again, when you're a content provider with a lot of records, um, you 
you get into trouble very quickly, as we can see here. So this shows the publication time of such a record on the x-axis, and then this is CDF, a cumulative fraction on the y-axis. And what we can see here is that around 20% of publications take more than 10 seconds. So let's imagine you have terabytes of data, you want to announce it to the DHT, this is just taking ages. And you need to refresh those records every 24 hours. Um, to, to keep the content alive and available in the network, and this just doesn't stay. So the first challenge is this massive content publication part. Then the other challenge is the, the flip side, so the content retrieval performance. Um, again, this has the uh, lookup time for these records on the x-axis, and again, a cumulative fraction on the y-axis. And uh, we can see that at least in Europe and the US, this, these are the uh, two lines on, on the left, um, from these th three, and uh, we, we can see that most of the requests are actually resolved within half a second, but as you see, uh, recall that we have provider and peer records, so we need to actually do two of these lookups, which adds up, and we are still in order, at least one order of magnitude away of HTTP content retrieval times. So content retrieval performance is our challenge number two. And challenge, challenge number three is adoption. Um, so what we, what we found um, with this, uh, at this source at, at the bottom here is that 58% um, of, uh, of website traffic, tra traffic actually originate from mobile clients. And putting IPFS on mobile clients is not quite, uh, so it doesn't work right now because of the resource footprint of IPFS. So this is a big challenge. And as we can see here, over 90% of internet users actually access the internet uh, using a mobile phone. So how can we solve that problem, this adoption challenge here? And so Procollapse explored some hybrid options. So how can we, so let's sacrifice the decentralization aspect to like just a bit to gain uh, massive performance improvements. And at Procollapse we developed interplanetary network indexes on the top right that addresses the massive content publication challenge. Then for content retrieval performance we developed Hydra boosters. And for adoption, especially on mobile clients, uh, we have deployed HTTP gateways, which are all semi-centralized uh, components of the, of the network. And yeah, I want, to, I want to briefly explain how each of them work. So these interplanetary network indexers are mo mainly designed to accelerate this massive content publication. Um, it is a complementary component to the DHT. It is in it also indexes provider records, and you can think of it as a high-performance key-value store. And the provider records are a bit different. Recall provider records in the DHT map peer IDs, uh, sorry, CIDs to peer IDs, but in this network indexer, they also contain the network addresses already and the retrieval pro protocol. In the case of IPFS, this is BitSwap, but it could also be, for example, GraphSync. So you do one request, and the case of um, the PL operated CID dot contact indexer um, to slash CID slash your CID that you want to look up, and then you receive the record, which includes the network addresses where the CID is hosted. You can connect to that host and retrieve it, uh, retrieve the data. Um, the talk right after me is from Marcy. We'll get we'll get into much more detail in how uh, the, the indexes work and the way forward and so on. So I would highly recommend that you stick around after this talk. Then Hydra boosters are a new type of DHT server that is designed to accelerate content routing. Um, so one Hydra booster consists of thousands of virtual Hydra heads, where all of these Hydra heads are connected to the same, the, the same common underlying database that stores all the provider records. And the trick here is that these Hydra heads are strategically placed into the DHT in the um, I, in the DHT key space, so that each provider record storage request, so I recall we are storing it with 20 peers, that there's, they are placed strategically such that at least one of these requests, one of these 20 peers, will always be one of these, these Hydra heads, which means that the Hydra knows all of the provider records of the network, and then when later in the game, someone wants to look up that provider record, and uh, because there are so many Hydra heads, it is very likely that you hit one of these Hydra heads right away, and even if it's far away in this key space, it can immediately share this or serve this provider record because it has the common database underneath. 
And the HTTP gateways um, is designed to improve adoption of IPFS and basically meant as a bridge between uh, the HTTP world and the IPFS world. And it is bundled within Kubo, so if you ever run the Kubo daemon, you will find uh, at the end of the log, log output that there's a, a, a gateway running on port 8080, I believe. And this has a similarly simple um, HTTP API, as you can see here. So you just uh, go to, in, this, in the case of ProCollapse, we are hosting one of these gateways at IPFS.io. You go to IPFS.io slash IPFS slash your CID. But instead of being served the provider record, you get served the actual content. So I've, the, the, the gateway will go out into the network and fetch it. And this has a couple of advantages. For example, the aggregation of demand in these centralized uh, gateways allows, and the, the concept of content addressing allows for very efficient and aggressive uh, caching of the content. And there are actually plenty of um, gateways deployed, and you can see it on the right. There's the uh, yeah, a list of public gateways that you can use. But I think IPFS.io is the uh, most important one. So these are the three components for these three challenges. Um, so how does it? Uh, how do they actually perform? So do they actually solve what they were set out to solve? And for this, we did a measurement campaign, and we measured all of these different components, and I want to share some, some numbers here. Um, for example, the indexers store around 100 times, or two, two orders of magnitudes more provider records than the DHT. And the top providers, the top single providers in, in, each, uh, in, in the indexer, actually um, provide or offer more than 100 or 1,000 times more records. Um, so you, can, you could argue, okay, so the indexer basically dwarfs the, the DHT in terms of indexing capability, but it's actually a little more tricky because um, the indexer itself only uh, has indexed content from around 600 to 700 providers. I'm not sure if this is the most up-to-date number, but this is the number I have, so 10, 10 to the 2 probably. And the DHT hosts um, provider records from over 50,000 providers. So it's like we have more providers that serve or offer less content in the DHT. And in IPNI, we have less providers that uh, serve more content. So I would argue it serves, so it, it solves the problem for these massive content, uh, content hosts very efficiently here. And each advertisement, which is a concept of, uh, of, the, of IPNI that probably Masi will go into later as well, each advertisement con contains around 10 to the 4 CIDs, and so you can do the maths. And uh, each like indexing each provider record takes around 500 millis uh, microseconds, and compare this with the 10 plus seconds of a single provider record in the DHT, so this is like a massive speed up for these types of uh, content hosters. Um, on the content retrieval side, um, the, so I mapped the content retrieval performance challenge to the Hydra boosters, but actually IPNI also helps with that because of uh, the, the centralized nature. Um, here we have like an example of uh, content retrieval times compa compared in different region between the DHT and this network indexers. And uh, here we can see that, in, for, for example, in the uh, AP Southeast 2 case, um, DHT lookups take around one and a half seconds. The uncached IPNI case is around 300 milliseconds, and if it's cached at the edge with, um, I don't know, with the CDN, or I think it's CloudFront in this case, you can get it down to less than 10, 10 millisecond lookup times for, for provider records. So a massive speed up here as well. Um, in the case of Hydra boosters, we did an experiment. Uh, so we did a bunch of DHT lookups from different vantage point, points all around the world. And in one case, we had this common Hydra database enabled. And in the other case, we have, um, we have ignored Hydra boosters uh, at all. Um, and we found that the, the lookup times uh, dec uh, increased, obviously. Um, but not as much as we expected. You need, to, you need to think about when these Hydra boosters were designed, the lookup times were not around one second or slightly less than one second. The lookup times were in the order of multiple seconds, so uh, maybe, maybe tens of seconds. Um, but now we find, okay, Hydra boosters actually, uh, it, they increase the performance or improve the performance, but not so much anymore. Then in terms of adoption, um, for us, the, the gateways are the main mechanism to improve adoption, and we looked at, um, at the gateway adoption 
um, from a client, client perspective. And what we find, what's also on the right here, um, this shows the traffic requests um, and, and, and users of, of our gateways in different, uh, different metrics. We find that 32% of the total traffic and 90% of total requests come from mobile devices, which indicate great usage on mobile, which was previously just cut out of the IPFS ecosystem. And 33% 33, 33 of total traffic and 30% of total requests are originating from desktops. And we also have like a net tools category, category which includes things like WGET, which is also surprisingly high uh, in this case. Um, in terms of web developer adoption, we find that um, three times fewer requests um, originate to, or like reach the HTTP gateways without a referrer, which means, or which we interpret as this request doesn't originate from, from, from a website. So this request is not, so, so this request doesn't come from a website, which means that three times more requests come from websites that have actually embedded HTTP CRL or use IPFS in their, uh, yeah, in, in their websites set up. So it, it seems like web developers make use of H these HTTP gateways to ease adoption of the IPFS network. But at the same time, we also find that the top 23% of website referrers make up over 70% of the requests. So a huge, uh, like yeah, some kind of centralization here, you could argue. Um, Obviously, with the deployment of these tools, there come um, a couple of trade-offs, and I want to just highlight a few. Um, for, for example, for the interplanetary network indexers, um, a failure of these indexers could render significant volumes of the provider records inaccessible, which is a problem. Um, however, there are seven indexes available right now, and ProLabs is working on a federation protocol so that these IPNIs can actually share these advertisements between each other, which will also Marcy explain, I, I believe, in, the, in his next talk. Then on the Hydra Booster side, um, because we are deploying like thousands of virtual heads in the DHT, um, it has massive influence over the routing, which could re, um, enable result poisoning, so it could just serve bogus records to, to, to users. And it's, it also poses the risk of eclipse attacks. Um, but we figured that this is actually quite difficult to leverage, and the worst thing that can happen is that um, you have slow retrievals, but it cannot compromise availability of records. So it's actually not that bad. On the HTTP gateway side, we set, by using it, we sacrifice end-to-end -end verification of CIDs. So when your browser requests a CID from, a, an, from an HTTP gateway, you're not doing the CID verification of this content that actually got served to you. So it's not matched against the, uh, the CID. But we are also working on, like, a, a, on service workers that intercept these HTTP requests and uh, that do the verification on the client side as well. But um, from, for me personally, the, the biggest risk is the compromised privacy. So um, operators that deploy these kinds of systems have actually a big view into usage patterns and so on. And this asymmetry of power is like a key concern when deploying and operating uh, these kinds of systems. And there are actually like this, the centralization versus decentralization discussion is like it, it, it's a spectrum, and we haven't touched on all these different other parameters here as well. So this is just a glimpse in in, in what uh, what we can actually uh, yeah. So so the problem space is, is huge actually, and this is just the, the technical side here that that I discussed. But actually, there's one more thing because we have actually shut down the Hydra boosters. You remember that graph on the bottom left? I mentioned that we figured the improvement that Hydra boosters bring are actually not that big anymore for the monetary, for one, for the monetary cost that they incurred for, for protocol labs, but also with all these different um, privacy concerns that I, that I mentioned. So at the end of November last year, that you can see on the bottom right, which shows the retrieval times as a rolling average, um, we cut or we shut down the Hydra database, which stored the provider records. It, still participated in peer routing, so serving peer records, but it didn't serve any provider records anymore. And what we saw is this massive spike in latency, and then it leveled up in a, uh, so, so then, then we found another plateau. And what, we, uh, what, what you can think of is this difference here between these two lines is roughly the performance hit that we incur by shutting down Hydra boosters. So, in my opinion, this is like a, this is exactly the success story. So, we are building 
is, is like we're helping a centralized, as so we're building and deploying a centralized, semi-centralized system, the um, ecosystem evolves and is at, in a, at a later point in time uh, in a stage where we can actually shut down and remove the centralized system so that the decentralized system can stand on, on its own. So, but what happened here? This is a different story, and I highly recommend reading this blog post from my colleague Yanis, and uh, it's called What Happens When Half of the Network Is Down. So right at the same time when we shut down the hydro boosters, we identified that actually over 60% of the nodes in the IPFS network were unreachable, and we haven't even noticed. So this is like a huge advantage and like a great success story for decentralization, because imagine any centralized service if 60% of the infrastructure is down, you would definitely notice service interruptions and so on. And the only thing that we noticed is a de degraded retrieval performance. And uh, yeah, it, this, this blog post gets, goes into much more detail. Uh, highly recommend reading, reading that. So let's conclude. Um, in my opinion, these measurements demonstrate effectiveness in addressing these decentralization challenges. It's still up to the developers to um, balance these trade-offs because all of these components are optional. Um, the Hydra boosters are approved for a viable path that we are taking. We compromise decentralization to drive adoption and revert as soon as the ecosystem is ready for um, living without decentralized components. And yeah, you can find more of this data, um, performance information and so on um, in our weekly reports, which we publish at stats.ipfs.network. Um, more comprehensive information at problab.io, our website where we publish um, daily uh, measurement results. All the code for the tools are available at PL Problab organization at GitHub. And yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Cool, yeah. We have time for maybe one, maybe two small questions. Um, doesn't the fact that the indexers have uh, orders of magnitude more uh, records, uh, despite having uh, uh, two orders of magnitude fewer participating nodes, uh, doesn't that mean that DHT is essentially not capable of supporting this data set, especially we're talking about indexing individual blocks from Filecoin? Right. Yeah. That's, I, I would say so that the orders of magnitude that these massive content providers um, have of more data, um, this right now cannot be indexed in the DHT, and so I would consider these indexes, again, as a bridge until something, something better, better, better comes along. And uh, yeah, so I, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we can take one more question. Okay. Over there. All the way in the back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm curious, Dennis, I'm not a planted question, I promise. Um, if, say, I'm some other network other than IPFS that's building on top of some of the similar protocols like other libp2p-based um, networks like Ethereum, Polkadot, etc., can I use any of the interesting analytics that you guys are creating at ProBlab? Um, or are there any particular areas that I should be paying attention or following along to analyze overall node distribution or um, you know, other transaction volume that might be useful? I mean, we are, um, so one of the tools that we are, we've built is like, like a, a network crawler, which um, doesn't, doesn't only support IPF, like the Amino DHT, that's how we call it right now, the IPFS DHT, but also um, supports crawling the, the Polkadot network, which could give insights into agent versions distributions and, and uh, uptake of new agent versions and so on, which extends to also Kusama and other substrate networks. Um, so this is one, one area. Um, so if you're interested in that data and these in probably tailored measurements for your network, just uh, yeah, reach out to us and we're happy to deploy these systems yeah, to your network. Cool, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you.